Sure. It's nothing. You just have a seat. You're going that way. No. You're supposed to be on this side. No. This is way too exposed. <laughs> there you go. You want your car to be You got my anchor self on the head. He got his seat. I'll be ready to lift up on the head. I always felt that way. You better tell me. He gets upset with me if I feel like I just explained to you that it doesn't lift up on the handle. Because that's the only way you can open it right now. I'll fix it tomorrow. Okay. Oh, push, you have to push it or not. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. Like, it's yeah. not I can in that jam way. Jam it with my shoulder. To get mm -hmm. it you, you can do that. I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shove that door. I'm starting to say something else, but I'm not going yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the open door. Where am I? We don't have an HR all right, we're in Second John. We're going to start that tonight. I don't know if we'll finish it tonight or not, but uh, uh, we'll get a good chunk of Second John finished tonight because there's only 13 verses, so we'll see how far we get. But before we begin, let's uh, go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for this day and for the many blessings that You've given us. And we thank Thee especially for Your Son, Jesus, who loved us enough to die up on that cruel cross for our potential salvation if we'll be faithful to Thee. We are thankful, Father, that we can gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to encourage one another and to be able to study Thy Word without fear of persecution. And we ask that You would be with us, that we would open our hearts to receive the truth and nothing but the truth that we might be better able to go out into the world and face temptations placed before us. And we ask also, Father, that you would give us opportunities that we might be able to talk with others about your love and, and your desire that all men be saved. We ask, Father, that you'd be with those of our numbers who have physical ailments, that they might uh, recover from these ailments, and that you might use us as instruments to reach out to them and help them in any way that we can. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, I might mention that Jean is not going to be here tonight. That was my first question. <laughs> I spent six hours with him at the ER really? Monday. Oh, that's um, right. He was not able to go to the bathroom. Oh. And, uh, so we ended up going up to a urologist and everything, and he's wearing a nice big bag on his leg, actually on the bed. And I told him, I said, he has no business changing from a big bag to a small bag because that's how you get infections, so that's why he's not here tonight. But he certainly wishes that he was here. Anyway, he'll have a catheter, catheter until Monday, and he'll get it removed Monday, and things should go well. Um, also, Beth Arnhart is going to have outpatient surgery tomorrow, and uh, we want to keep her in our prayers. Uh, Cal, I haven't got the results back from him yet, uh, but he did have his first treatment today. Jelly said he's doing right. So Good. It's really going well. Well, radiation is not as bad as chemotherapy, but radiation is bad. So it's a, it's a tough process. Uh, let's see here. Who else? Uh, Michelle McBride, I haven't uh, heard yet. At, she didn't have her operation. Oh, she didn't have the operation? It's still uh, pending. <laughs> still pending, okay. Yeah, whatever they give us a time. All right. So now I can predict until. <laughs> <laughs> when they call and say, be here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Today. <laughs> pending, okay. Uh, Glenda Bowen's cousin, Lee, will have brain tumor surgery Friday then. And I think if you did not receive it, uh, John sent out a message yesterday. I guess it was yesterday afternoon. Uh, Wilma Payne's sister, Lee Baker, passed away Tuesday morning. So, 
Wilma's handling it good. There's no uh, funeral arrangements as of yet. The family will meet at 5 p.m. this afternoon at the funeral home, and they'll decide at that point when the funeral will be. So when we find out, we'll let you know. All right, uh, let's look at uh, 2 John, and we'll begin by reading verses 1 through 3. And Isaac, could we start with you tonight? Sure can. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in the truth and love. Okay. First thing we see is that two-word <coughs> phrase, the elder. Was John an elder? Yes. I'm on the right track. <laughs> You're on the right track? Peter was an elder. Peter was an elder. Yes, Peter was an elder. And... Although John refers to himself as the elder here, but he did not refer to it in the sense of a bishop in the local church, but rather in the sense as an older or aged person who is counseling loved ones. Remember that John is the only apostle that died of a natural cause. The others were all martyrs. Uh, it might also have been a reference to his authority as an apostle. Uh, the presbyter is another word that could be used in that sense, but he was not referring to him as self as being an elder in the local church. Uh, this letter is addressed to the elect lady and her children. And this is a phrase that has given rise to much diversity over uh, who it, it, the letter is meant for. Uh, some think that it's a particular Christian woman and her family, uh, because when you look at 3 John, Third John was addressed to an individual. Uh, just turn over there real quick and look at Third John chapter one. He says, "To the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth." And so that was addressed to an individual. So therefore, some think that this was addressed to a Christian woman. But it says, "To the elect lady and her children." Uh, some hold that Second John likewise was addressed uh, to the elect Curia. Curia was a Greek word translated lady. Others contend that John was addressing a church and its members. Whichever is true, though, the undeniable conclusion is that he wrote this to Christians in Asia Minor, where the false system of Gnostic teaching, you remember we've been talking about that quite a bit, that John's been dealing with that, so was Peter, <coughs> and Gnostic teaching had begun to take root and had already led some astray. Uh, Go back to 1 John chapter 2 and look at verses 18 and 19. Uh, Ron, you have that? <clears throat> but little children, it is the last hour. And as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. And so John was referring to Gnostic teaching when he made those statements in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. The word truth is used five times in these first four verses. And perhaps John did this to distinguish the contrast from those walking in the error of Gnosticism. The elect lady was loved in the truth, meant she was associated with the truth, and stood against those who held to false doctrine. The bond of love between them was not the natural affection of ordinary human friendship, but this affection was because of their mutual love for the truth. Christians are cemented together with a like precious faith. Founded upon the revealed word of God. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 1, uh, Florence. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained 
thy precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, and you see that Peter refers to that phrase like precious faith founded upon the revealed word of God. It is the same body of truth or the doctrine uh, that we see in verses 9 and 10 of Second John where it says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. Alright, so, it is also the same body of truth that abides forever. Uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verses 23, and 20, or 23 through 25, Maxine. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass with heareth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Alright, so, as John mentions there, in, or I'm sorry, Peter mentions in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, things of this world is going to pass away. Whether you look at the vegetation, whether you look at animal life, whatever you look at, these things are temporary. But the word or the body of truth will abide forever. So when we look at the purpose and the date, we look at verse 3 uh, that uh, Isaac read where he says grace mercy and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of the Father in truth and love so because this elect lady stood faithful in the truth John was assuring her that these blessings were hers grace is unmerited favor whereas mercy is what if grace is unmerited favor what is mercy Could we say that it is grace in action? If grace is unmerited favor, then mercy, God's mercy, would be grace in action, wouldn't it? Okay? The word peace is the condition that results from grace and mercy. If we... If grace is unmerited favor... And God's mercy is that grace in action. And we have that, then we will have peace, won't we? There'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more pain, no troubles, nothing. Because we will be at peace. Uh, mercy is a verb of grace. Do what? Mercy is a verb of grace. It is, it is. <laughs> the purpose for which John wrote this letter then is summed up in the words truth and love. And... The false philosophy of Gnosticism was prevalent, but this elect lady and her children stood opposed to the Antichrist. It is generally accepted that this letter was written somewhere around 90 A.D. and is closely connected to the time that 1 John was written. Alright, so let's look at verses uh, 4 through 6, uh, Kathy, of 2 John. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the fathers, Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that, is you, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Okay, and there are two ways to look at these three verses here. Uh, first off, verses 4 and 5 deals with loving one another. But verses 4 through 6 is talking about walking in love or the pathway of truth and love. It's another way of looking at it. 
And when we look at what verse 4 said, the body of this letter opens with an expression of joy. Look at that again. I rejoice greatly. John has found certain members of her family walking in the truth. Her family being the elect lady. Okay? <laughs> that is, their manner of lifestyle was in obedience to the truth that had been taught them. Uh, go back to 1 John chapter 1. Look at verses 5 through 7. Uh, Jensen? <laughs> Do what? First John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 6 through 7? Yes, through 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, and we can follow that up with uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Uh, Pat? Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Okay, so obviously what John is talking about here is, is uh, uh, the manner of lifestyle of which Christians should have, and that is to uh, in obedience to the truth. And what he's saying here in verse 4 then is, I have found some of your children walking in truth. Now again, this, uh, we don't know whether this is in, uh, referring to an individual woman and her children or if it's referring to uh, the church and some of the Christians in that congregation or some of the brethren uh, is another way of saying it. Uh, it's not really a matter of debate there because again, John is talking to Christians. And there is no debate over the fact that there is reason for great rejoicing to hear of brethren who continue to live righteously according to the commandments from the Father. So we look at verse 5 then, and, and like uh, this verse, like 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, and uh, go ahead and turn over there. Uh, Don, I'll let you read that because it's similar to 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, and an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Okay, so here in verse 5, just like in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, John's talking about the beginning. Uh, in other words, he's talking to them about when the gospel was first preached to them. Uh, to love one another was set forth in the law of Moses, yet Christ gave a new standard. And that new standard we find in John, the 13th chapter, verses 34 and 35. You have that, Isaac? Yeah. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, and if you have love for one another. Okay. And, of course, the word love there, if you look at the Greek, is agape love. Uh, enough love that we have for each other that we are concerned about each other's souls. Uh, so much so that we will do whatever is necessary to help win souls over to Christ. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, verse 10. Uh, Ron? Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay. So to walk is, or to love is to walk in obedience to his commands, according to verse 6 in 2 John here, where he says, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So the idea then is that as Christians, uh, we see a singular word here, commandment, not months, but one singular commandment refers to the commandment to love one another. If one loves God, one will also love his brethren. Look at 1 John chapter 4 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago in verses 20 and 21, uh, Florence. 1 John 4, verse 20 and 21. 
Yeah, First John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. I've got it up on the screen now. Okay, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Okay. So obviously, then, the reason God's commandments are not regarded as burdensome is because the motive that inspires obedience is love. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, Maxine. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Okay. So since love for God and obedience to his commandments are inseparable, this kind of love for God will test false teachers and it will expose them. Uh, look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Kathy. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So if you think about it, this love for the truth and this love for one another is unlike the empty professions of love by those who make no attempt to warn people of the erroneous doctrines prevalent in the world today. <coughs> In fact, when you study with someone that really doesn't have this love that John is talking about, it's not too difficult to get them riled up and make them angry uh, because they recognize that there is a false teaching and they had nothing to stand on when it comes to the Word of God. But we, as Christians, we do have the Word of God and we can speak from the Word of God. We don't have to say, well, I think or I feel or God came to me in a prayer, or anything like that, because we have the Word of God. Any thoughts or any comments through verse 6? All right, let's look at verses 7 through 11 then, uh, Jensen. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. I'm reading the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares his evil deeds. All right. So verses 7 through 11, uh, John is telling the Christians to watch out for error. And when you break it down a little bit more in verses 7 and 8, uh, he says, do not be deceived by false teachers. And he actually uses the word antichrist in verse 7. What John is doing now, he, he's coming to the heart of this letter by warning against the deceivers who have entered into the world. Uh, they once claimed to hold to the faith in Jesus Christ, but they went out from us. You remember he told us that back in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, of which we read a little bit earlier. They denied that he was truly man and truly God. And any teacher who denies this truth about Jesus Christ proves himself to be a deceiver and also an antichrist. Again, antichrist, we all understand that, but it just means against Christ. Uh, if you do not agree with him, if you do not stand with his, his teachings uh, and his commandments, then you are against him. Uh, we look at verse 8 then. And in one clear message in John's epistles is that it matters what doctrine one believes and practices. Uh, Christians must be on the lookout and watchful for false teachers lest they be deceived. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. Uh, Pat.
<clears throat> for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing that if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Is that it? Yeah. You remember Jesus Christ even talked about the fact that there would be wolves in sheep's clothing among you. Paul told the uh, elders at Ephesus uh, the same thing, that there would be some from them that would even depart from the truth. And so we know that one can be led astray from the gospel uh, that these apostles have labored so greatly to teach. Uh, let's see what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19. Uh, Donna, and then I'll also have you read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 if you would. Having faith and a good conscience which has some dejected concerning the faith having suffered shipwreck. Mm. 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctors of demons. Okay. So we know some's going to depart from the faith. Uh, we may very well know individuals that once were very faithful uh, that have left the church. Uh, we may have relatives. We may have very close friends that have departed from the church. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't love them. Uh, in fact, what it means is that we should let them know that we're concerned about them and that we have a, uh, a very great desire that they uh, turn back to God and do those things that God expects them to do. But the apostles have told us that people are going to leave the gospel for various reasons. Satan is very, very strong and very capable of tempting anyone at any time if we let our guard down. Therefore, we must constantly be on guard and persevere in faithfulness to receive the full and complete reward of eternal life. In fact, that's what Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 says. And, and then at the end of every sermon, you know, we always had those scriptures up there. And the last scripture we have is Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto or unto death. And... Uh, same thing in the marriage ceremony uh, that we, the vows that we all took and everything that we would love and cherish and be faithful unto death in sickness or in health. Um, and yet we've seen situations there where they have mimicked exactly what uh, Paul is telling Timothy here that there's going to be some that will stray, that will depart for various reasons. Even in the marriage bond, uh, the, uh, because of, of sickness or poor health or various reasons, uh, they depart. And same thing when it comes to serving God. Whatever the reason is, they depart. Any thoughts through verse 8? All right, when we look at verse 9 then, uh, he says, Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. The idea that John is putting forth here is that we should not go beyond the doctrine of Christ. Christ is both the center and the substance of the gospel. And to accept his deity is to accept his doctrine. Uh, let me put that up there, I guess I should. And we want to go to Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 18 through 20. Uh, Isaac, I'm sorry I didn't have that up earlier. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So first off, Jesus says, All authority is given to me, which means that there's nothing left because Jesus has all 
the authority. Therefore, we must accept his deity and we must accept his doctrine. If we refuse to do that, then uh, we are accepting a destination that is not desired by God. On the other hand, to accept his doctrine is to accept his deity. Look at John 7, verses 16 and 17. Uh, Ron? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Okay, so the doctrine of Christ then is therefore not limited by this context to teach about the deity of Christ, but rather this phrase would include all the teaching that derives from Christ because he is the divine Son of God. And then in verse 9, whoever transgresses is translated anyone who goes too far, according to the New American Standard Version, uh, NIV says anyone who runs ahead. And the American Standard Version says uh, whoever goeth onward. Uh, I, I found that NIV uh, version a little bit interesting in the sense that I immediately thought of a character in the Old Testament. You remember who that was? Who ran ahead of God? Who was told to go to Nineveh and preach? Jonah. Jonah. <laughs> Didn't he run ahead of God for a while? I don't even know him for that, but okay. <laughs> Not very far. Well, no, we know him for other things, but, but uh, there was one time that he resisted God, one time he ran ahead of God, one time he ran with God. Uh, he was angry because God desired Nineveh to be saved. Uh, he didn't think that would happen. Uh, I'm embellishing, obviously, a little bit of the story, but uh, certainly Jonah at one point did run ahead. The meaning, though, is clear that anyone who is so progressive religiously that he goes beyond the authority found in the Scriptures certainly is without God's approval and fellowship. And this was Jonah for a short time. We must speak as the oracles of God or be silent. Look at what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, Florence. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Okay. So speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. The modernist, though, on the other hand, declares that the Bible is outdated and the Bible needs to be uh, revised a little bit or adapted to current morals accepted in society. And we've seen a number of changes. Such teaching, though, should be immediately identified as the work of one accursed of God. Now, there are some things that we see changes taking place that we may not say that this is a curse of God, but certainly there is a change in attitude towards God. Uh, a big change. I've seen people complain if the preacher goes over 30 minutes in the preaching. I've seen people refuse to uh, show respect towards God, and yet they'll show respect towards the dead. And by, by that, I simply mean that They'll wear a, the best clothing they have, a suit or whatever, uh, for a funeral. But when it comes to the worship service and everything, they'll come in a T-shirt. They don't think God sees them. Uh, yeah, they don't think God sees them. That's probably right, Pat. Well, it is. Uh, well, he does. If, huh? they, if they thought he did, they would dress better. Yeah. To, I mean, they would not, not anything fancy, but the best, whatever they've got that they can present themselves in in a very respectful way. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how to put that into but, I, you know, and that's just one thing. I mean, you can go on and on with a number of things that you see changes today. Changes such as the attitude towards the movies. 10, 15, 20 years ago, you could go to a movie and feel pretty comfortable that that would be a good, clean movie. Today, it's very seldom that you'll find a clean movie. Even Walt Disney has changed. You won't find a G-rated movie of Walt Disney's today. 
That's a shame. And I suspect Walt Disney himself is probably turning over in his grave just because of the changes that take place. <laughs> yeah. uh, you look at Walmart. Walton, when he established Walmart, refused to have alcoholic beverages in his stores. Look what's there now. It's a change in attitude. And uh, that's exactly right. Uh, at, at one point, when they started making all those other movies, if, you, if they made the clean movies with all the swearing and, you know, the, those will actually make more money than the movies that they're coming out with. But it's what Hollywood wanted to brainwash the public with that was the agenda. Well, yeah. And you look, I mean, look at the change in the attitude towards uh, premarital sex. The change in the attitude towards not getting married but just living together. All of these things are changes in attitude. When we get into studying 1 Corinthians and everything, we'll look at some scriptures there that's some huge issues today that people would suggest that uh, it doesn't apply. And it's just because of a change of attitude. But yet God is the same yesterday, He's the same today, and He's the same tomorrow. He's unchanging. And Christians who accept that will also be unchanging. So. Indeed, we do learn the commandments of God either by direct statement, approved apostolic example, or necessary inference. Uh, and we need to certainly abide in that. Uh, we didn't read Galatians, the first chapter, verses 6 through 8, though. Maxine, let's read that. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another that there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach in any other gospel unto you than which was have which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Okay. So when we think about the way God gives us commandments, like I say, direct statement, approved apostolic example, or necessary inference. Uh, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Uh, Kathy? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, early equipped for every good work. Okay. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Jensen. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by the glory and by glory and virtue. Okay. Now, you don't need to give the book, chapter, and verse or anything, but uh, tell me as close as you can. Can you think of a direct statement or a direct command? God tells us what to do by direct commands. Mm -hmm. Can you think of one? Well, the Ten Commandments is full of them. Okay, but in the New Testament, in the New Testament. and you're right. Uh, repent get, and be baptized. Uh, repent and be baptized. That's a direct command, isn't it? Worship on the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. Worship on the first day of the week. Uh, mm -hmm. Hebrews 10, 25 and 26, not forsaken the assembly of the saints. Is that a direct command or is it an example? Like command. command. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Does it say that we have to meet for every service? Like yes, in a, in a, it's inferred. <laughs> There's an example. There is an example. Okay, where's the example? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> you said you wouldn't. Something to do with other, some other do. You know, so do what? Yeah. Something to do with, uh, they're referring to not to do as, uh, as referring to others that do that. Isn't it? In the same sense, okay, okay. An example of meeting regularly, I think, would be found in Acts, the second chapter. Huh? Christians met daily, didn't they? Okay. Another example is upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Is that not an example? And uh, some will argue about 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Upon the first day of the week, let each of you lay by in store. Uh, some suggesting that's not suggesting or talking about contribution on the first day of the week. 
Uh, there are a few that would debate that. But it's, a, it's a, first off, there's an example, but there's a, uh, there's a command there. Let each of you lay by in store. There's a command, okay? So now going back to Hebrews 10, 25, and 26, it doesn't say that we have to meet every time the saints meet. But it does say upon the first day of the week, right? It says do not forsake the assembly. Upon the first day of the week, okay? So let me ask a question. If you miss Sunday morning and you're not used to going on Sunday night, if you miss Sunday night then, you have completely violated that command, haven't you? Well, not used to. I don't understand that one. Not used to? Not used to coming on Sunday night. Oh, there are a lot of people that I, don't. I mean, I missed the oh, question. Oh, okay. What yeah, what I'm saying is they come Sunday morning, but they don't come Sunday night. They don't come Wednesday night, okay? But for whatever reason, they're not able to come Sunday morning, and so they miss Sunday morning. But they don't come any other time. They still don't come Sunday night, even though they could. So they completely violated that command, not forsaking the assembly of the saints upon the first day of the week. So. But then you look at it another way, don't forsake the assembly of Christ. I agree. I In agree. General. <laughs> A faithful Christian, one who truly loves God, and this is what John is talking about, wouldn't even think about missing a service anyway if they could. As long as they're able to come, they would come. Well, and it's not a not a case of have to; it's a case of want to. Want to. Even on a Tuesday morning Bible class. You know. <laughs> or, or when you're traveling yeah, you on vacation. Get into that one. Huh? When you're traveling. What? Well, yeah, exactly right. Thing. When you're yeah, traveling. You have to, well, I have to, right? You're assembling with other Christians. Yeah. Yeah, you can always take time if you want to. And some so. congregations only meet once on Sundays now. You're exactly right. Some yeah. of them, some of them, well. That's true, Kathy, but some of them that say they only meet once on Sunday, they'll have like a worship service and then they'll have a Bible class and then they'll have another worship service. Yeah, I All that. together. <laughs> All together. Because they're, they're come from so far apart that they don't, yeah. yeah. And they lump, this is my opinion now, this, I, I, I can't justify what they're doing, I, I'm not even trying to explain what they're doing, but my opinion why they lump the Bible class in between the two worship services, they hope that increases the attendance in the Bible class. Uh, I don't think it does because those that's going to come for worship service only, they'll come for the first service and they'll leave. Those that uh, want to sleep in a little bit, they'll miss Bible class and they'll come for the second service and they'll leave. So, But those who truly love God, they're going to be there regardless. And they're going to be an encouragement to each other. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's one of those things where all we can do is teach what the Bible says and be silent where the Bible's silent. Yes, Pat? I forgot where it's at because I don't pay that much attention to it. The scripture where two or three are, are together there. In my name the there, am I also? It's one of the Gospels, but what was that put there for? Well, Jesus was just pointing. Jesus was just pointing there that he would always be with his saints. It wasn't, but when he said two or three, does that mean it doesn't have anything to do with worship service? Really no, matters. because the church okay. didn't even exist then. Okay, it didn't it? Not in the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> Some so, there would be okay. places you may only have two or three. That's I, okay. Oh, yeah. But I have been congregations where there were five. There were five of us. One man. Yeah. Four women. That's it. Well, when I when I was in the military and we went mm -hmm. to Fort Lee, Virginia, for basic training there. Uh, the congregation where we went there, I think they only had seven members, so it was nothing for me to get up and preach the sermon, lead the first prayer, and, and <laughs> yeah, do the Lord's Supper did. and lead singing. That had to be in Kathy's case, too. Yeah, <laughs> One did, man and four everything. women. Yeah. Who do you think did it all? But on the other hand, when I was in the military at Fort Carson, Colorado, we had this family, uh, father and, and mother and two children, and they loved to go fishing on, and camping on the weekends. So he told me, he says, we always take the Lord's Supper with us and while we're out in the boat and everything we take the Lord's Supper in the boat and there are some people who think that's the only reason to come to worship service for the Lord's Supper and that was kind of his attitude and so I asked him a question I said are you doing this for your convenience or God's convenience because God says you should encourage one another and teach and admonish one another through song and hymns and you're not doing that part of it so it has to be for your convenience so <laughs> 
Because they want to go on vacation or in a, in a <laughs> yeah. So, any any thoughts? Hmm. I mean, we got off on a little tangent here, but I think it was a good tangent because well, we are I talking have a about question. yes. On giving every Sunday, what is your opinion on some of the larger congregations? I know. I mean, they set it up where you can have it like direct deposit, have it directly taken every oh. Sunday from your checking account to the church's checking account. Oh, that's tacky. <laughs> no, it's just not I the mean, norm. It's, it's, I guess in reality... I lost it on Sunday that it's transferred. This is the new age weird. of doing so things. It's modern for me. Well, yeah. oh, it, it feels weird, but it's not... You, no, where are you going to point to that says you can't? <laughs> You, you know, know there's a point of, well, I'm giving anyways, so I don't have to show up. We could get into even some. Even if you're gone, it's still going in. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't give you an excuse. But we yeah, could, we could get no, into I mean, some. if you're out of town. <laughs> yeah. oh. We could get into some good discussion on that alone because yes. I know that some people, uh, in their mind, look, if I don't give everything I'm supposed to give for the month when I get my paycheck, I'm, I might spend it throughout the month and I won't have right. what I should be given. Yeah. And so they'll give everything on the first Sunday of the month, okay, uh, that they're going to give for that month. I don't, I'm not going to say it's wrong. I'm not going to say it's right. Uh, giving is between me and God. Giving is not for you to know what I'm giving. It's not for me to know what you're giving. And, and the same with all of us. So that part of worship is, is a worship the same as prayer. It's between me and God. The same as the Lord's Supper. It's between me and God. And quite honestly, the same for worship. It's between me and God. And whether God is going to accept my mindset as to am I doing it for the right reasons. And uh, that's the only way I can answer that well, statement. Well, you only get paid once a month, right? Yes. Yeah. So giving as you prosper, so you should give. Capital. Some people get paid once a month. Some people get paid twice a month. Uh -huh. A few people get paid on a weekly basis. So, it, so weekly basis, well, they should give every week, because then every week you're getting. Paid. I know some people that will take when they get paid on a monthly basis. They'll t sit down and however many Sundays is that week, they'll write out that many checks exactly that time and give a check each week. Okay, that's the way they want to do it. I'm not saying that's the way it has to be done. Well, like, I mean, I'll use my kids for example. They, my kids don't have checks. They don't write checks for anything. It's ATM or it's you do whatever it is with your bank and tell your bank to pay that bill. Yeah. And they pay the bill. Yeah. And I, like, it feels strange. Yeah. So it's like, I guess that's what they do contribution too. It's like, pay the church this amount. <laughs> Done. Well, yeah. obviously this, this has been a good discussion. We did not finish Second John, so we'll finish that next week, and we'll answer the questions next week, and I'll have the questions for Third John next week, and we might get through a Third John next week as well. So if you've not picked up a copy of the questions and you want a copy, here they are right here. They disappeared, huh? Well, that's why I always make it. I want to take you to services Sunday morning. Please come back to pick her up because I wasn't a member already. I didn't do anything. Take her there, pick her up. And after a while, this is too much.